Good day, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Alex Malou from IBC Amina. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. We've got a very special webinar lined up. Uh, it's on a topic we've heard a lot about, um, Brexit. We all know, we, we think we know what Brexit's about, but uh, we have the best person in the industry to talk about it. And I'm delighted to introduce today uh, Warwick Smith from Instinctive Partners. Uh, he joined Instinctive Partners in October 2006 to actually establish the global public policy practice. And not only that, Warwick has also worked in UK government service for over 16 years as a policy advisor, ministerial aid and international negotiator. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Warwick. You're the highlight of our um, Eurocom last year, and uh, I'm sure you're going to do your best possible job in terms of filling us in as to what has happened a year and a half since then. Okay, uh, Alex, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, Alex has given my background, but I think on this topic, it's always important to declare your interest. So I describe myself as a pragmatic remainer. Um, I can be, uh, have the hell frustrated out of me by the, uh, the European Commission, but I decided that the UK was better in than, than out. Um, it's uh, not frequently these days that you get a, a, a balanced view, so best to declare. I, I wanted to kick off just by trying to put Brexit in a, in a broader context. Uh, and, and over the past two or three years, I've had seminal moments at 2 a.m. Um, what one was with the referendum, one was with the uh, the, the, the Trump election victory, and, and one was um, with the last UK general election. When on each occasion at 2 a.m., I shrugged and, and went to bed. So I think we can see a a, a general trend. Um, what the Americans tend to call uh, the, the people we fly over um, revolting. I, I see it slightly differently. Um, and, and this slide was actually put together to, to look at sort of um, uh, stuff going on in the UK and stuff going on in Italy over the ages. But I, I do see a cycle where the world is very happy with collectivism or multilateralism and gradually disaffection or alienation builds up be it you know, the, the, the people unhappy with um, the Senate in Rome or the king unhappy with the Pope or the people getting unhappy with um, economic troubles and moving to individualism or populism rapidly followed by strong characters coming to the fore. And I do see ourselves at the moment uh, sort of on, on the the right end, uh, that's the, to the right of, of that cycle. I thought it might be interesting just to try and codify that for the EU. And these are taken, these numbers are taken from European Commission surveys. But I think fascinating that we've seen 70 new political parties in the EU in the last five years. Half or more of the people welcome that. Fewer than half of the people in the EU actually believe their voice counts. And if you look at that category of people I was talking to earlier, the old, the unemployed, those without um, a professional role in life, the number goes to almost zero. Um, 37%, only 37% of EU citizens regard themselves as committed Democrats and 40%, more than 40%, say that they would accept leadership by a strong man. I think you can, you can see that the, these numbers uh, support that trend, the cycle that I mentioned earlier. But the, the thing on this slide, the last couple of points, which is very different from the UK, is the way people are flocking away from the traditional centre-right and centre-left parties, having over half of the vote in 2014, and you know, estimated by the Commission that only about a quarter of the vote for those traditional centrist parties in um, in the next elections in in 2019. Um, absolutely fascinating the difference in the UK is you've actually seen a flow back to the major two parties which in the last election here got a, a greater share of the total vote 
than I think in the last three or four um, elections. But this is all about people who feel that they are disaffected, looking for ways to express that disaffection. Equally, I think it's fascinating that you know two thirds of people believe they are better off in the EU, which is people across the European Union, but 10% more believe that things are going in the wrong direction than believe that things are going in the right direction. So you know, even if you've got two thirds feeling better in, actually they're unhappy with the way things are going. And the three key issues that came across in this survey that people wanted governments, the EU, to focus on was security, youth unemployment, and immigration. So just as an aside, um, I think immigration has appeared in the top three issues of British general elections for the last four or five elections. It is always there or thereabouts. It is, it is not new. Um, I guess what has been new has been the tremendous focus on it and the migrant crisis. If you actually look at the numbers around the migrant crisis, they're probably less than you would have thought, um, at least from the, the coverage that they have, have got. And you know, a large number of those migrants were actually within the EU, but a large number were coming from the EU. Again, one of the things that tends not to get focused on is 70% of those migrants were actually people coming to do work in the EU and that, and, and younger people coming to do work in the EU. And that actually is something we're now seeing in, in the UK where there is concern about filling roles uh, be it nurses, be it doctors, be it fruit pickers in the fields of, of, of the flat east of England, suddenly um, the message is coming across that maybe migration isn't all bad and maybe we, we should have painted this with a, a smaller paintbrush rather than the very broad strokes that we did. But the bottom line across Europe is that we have seen this tremendous growth in um, fringe, extreme parties, new parties, whatever you want to call them, and frankly, to the right and to the left. This is not a, a movement that goes in the traditional left-right direction one way or the other. This is a, a, a movement of people who feel disaffected and you know, take up the cudgels and form new parties to represent those who feel unrepresented. So I, I thought it was helpful to, um, to put Brexit into that category. Um, here in Europe, we are not alone. Um, here in the UK, we're not alone. These social pressures and political pressures are moving in similar directions um, across the Western world. Um, and I would say at a time when perhaps our politicians uh, lack some of the uh, the status and, and the, the big beast classification that we have in, in the past. So turning specifically to, to Brexit and you know, how on earth did we get to this stage, put the referendum to one side for a moment, though I'm very happy to talk about the referendum. Uh, having taken the, ref the, the referendum, having got the result, having forgotten it was meant to be advisory, if that's what the legislation says, we announced we're leaving the European Union. And you know, as a former negotiator for the UK government, there are some basic rules that you, you never breach. So we notified the European Commission under Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union that we were going to leave in two years. We did it before we'd worked out quite what we wanted as, as a country. We boxed ourselves into that two-year period. We allowed the EU27, as they are now known pretty ubiquitously, to start writing down what the end result would look like. And we failed to understand and work with people in Brussels. That's why I'm saying we, the, the, the UK government. And the one I think a, a, a lack 
of understanding. Part of that lack of understanding goes back to why these countries are in the European Union to start with. Um, David Davis uses a, a rather more elegant phrase than the one I once used to him, and his phraseology is that he recognized eventually that 27 members of the European Union joined it after a period of economic or social unrest. Only the UK joined after a period of economic and social stability, putting the miners' strike to, to, to one side. So the reasons for being there are very different. For the UK, it's all about money, it's all about the economy, it's all about trade. For most other members of the European Union, it is about security. And the two Treaty of Rome preambles that I've picked out there talk about ever closer union. That people tend to blame subsequent treaties like Maastricht for this concept of ever closer union. No, it was in the original Treaty of Rome. And one of the reasons was to pull resources to preserve and strengthen peace and liberty. So when people in the UK and sometimes elsewhere talk slightly sneeringly about the other member states adhering to the project above the economy, it was never about the economy. It was always, always about a, a project to keep the peace in Europe after two world wars with very significant damage on all sides. I thought before going on, it was don't read the small print, read the large print. It was worthwhile just reflecting the famous Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union. Um, the, the big words, actually those that I think get lost a lot in the dialogue. Uh, what the treaty says is that the Union and the leaving member state has to conclude an agreement setting out the arrangements for withdrawal. It doesn't say it has to set out, it does uh, reach an agreement on how we're going to work together in the future. It says that that withdrawal agreement has to take account of the framework for the future relationship. So when we hear all of these discussions about, you know, is it a free trade agreement? Is it Canada plus plus plus? Is it the EEA? Actually, that is a level of detail um, that the treaty does not provide for the negotiators to go into. And one of the points where I think the, the UK negotiators and the European Union negotiators don't quite understand each other, don't quite gel. For the UK, this is all about getting that future framework. For the EU27, this is about the withdrawal agreement taking account of what the future framework is likely to be. So the withdrawal agreement is a legally binding treaty. The future framework is a political declaration. They are very different things. I think what everyone has got right is that this is a single approach. You know, the phrase, it's not done until it's all done, I'm sure we've all heard a lot. So I keep hearing people say, well, we've got the transition agreement. Well, actually, no, we haven't. We haven't got the transition agreement unless we agree the withdrawal agreement. And we don't have the withdrawal agreement unless we can be happy it takes account of the future relationship. So this is a little bit like three-dimensional chess. I think there has been some criticism of the UK in allowing the EU27 to set the agenda for these talks. Actually, I think that's unfair. Um, I think it is apparent in Article 50 what the agenda has to be. And I think it was necessary for the discussions to take place at all for there to be agreement on what needed to be included within the withdrawal agreement before the talk start. My criticism would be why we didn't try and or try harder to have informal discussions so the roadmap was better populated before we began the formal negotiations. And I think the answer to that is essentially political. Um, and when I say that on, on each side, I had a drink the other night with a civil servant who is in the heart of this. 
uh, someone who's worked in the Commission and worked in the UK government, currently working in, in the UK government, and he said to me that each side has shown itself in its worst possible light. And I think to some extent that that is that is right. But we gave notice under Article 50 when we did, before we were ready, simply because you may remember it was around this time of year and it was in the run up to the, or we gave, the Prime Minister gave the promise to trigger Article 50 in the run up to the Conservative Party conference. And I believe her view was, unless she had committed to triggering Article 50 by the end of the forthcoming March, she would not have got through the October party conference of two years ago. Um, I think what we've seen since then is that not only did that approach and time scale lead to some conflict and uh, an arrangement, an agreement, uh, a dialogue with the European Union, which was not as clear as it could be, neither has it satisfied the Conservative Party. And you'll be unsurprised to know I'll come on to that in, in, in a little while. But I think the key thing here is we can't take bits and pieces of this, it all has to be taken together. But I think Alex might recall me saying at a previous event, it's all about Ireland, it's always all about Ireland. And to some extent, um, I, I will, will stick on that. Um, there has been some criticism of the um, European Union's stance within the UK to do with Ireland. I think this ignores the fact that Ireland is a member of the European Union, is one of the 27, um, and therefore it is natural for the EU negotiators to look after its interests. We also, of course, come to the, 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 the single market point, touch on that a little bit more later, but it is critically important for the uh, European Union that it maintains the sanctity of the single European market. And it fears very much that the border with Northern Ireland could be a way that substandard goods or goods that do not meet European Union standards or that haven't made, haven't paid European Union tariffs find their way into the 27 via a backdoor offered by Northern Ireland. And again, I think this is something that is not always appreciated as much as it should be. I have to say, as a former negotiator, there was as a Brit, I was I was a, a, a little annoyed. As a former negotiator, I had to admire the suggestion of the Commission that this can be resolved by drawing the border up the middle of the Irish Sea and neatly reunifying Ireland. But I, I think a couple of points I've made there shows why Ireland is, is still the issue. And it's fascinating to see those um, in favour of a hard Brexit and maybe even a, a Brexit without an agreement, a no-deal Brexit as being called, and now saying, you know, the, 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 the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is nowhere near as big an issue as it should be, as it really is. Actually, it is a big issue. It's a big issue for the European Union. Um, because they see it as a, as a backdoor into the 27. It's a big issue for the UK um, you know, as a signatory of the Good Friday Agreement, talking about um, certain goods and services permeating the Irish border as if it wasn't there. And it is a big deal for other people who are concerned that some form of more physical border, let's not talk about a hard border, but something that makes life a bit more difficult than it is now has that subliminal effect of pushing back on the results of the, um, the Good Friday Agreement and the Irish negotiations. So I still believe that of all of the issues that need to be resolved, and we are 80% there on the withdrawal agreement, Ireland is the most difficult. I mean, I'll, I'll say this one thing before we come on to likely outcomes, I am detecting a softening of positions around this and the withdrawal agreement. Um, we have seen the Foreign Minister of Ireland 
using language like significant progress towards a resolution uh, as his red line rather than a resolution. Uh, and though I think this is really, really difficult, I can see some way of finding language in the withdrawal agreement that provides a, a fallback so that the, um, the idea of there being no hard border is enshrined. But that is really, really difficult for the Prime Minister, supported as she is in office. Um, I almost said power, and I'm not going to use the old joke, um, but the Prime Minister supported in office by the unionists in Northern Ireland who are no great fans of the European Union and support Brexit. So she is here and in other places um, you know, between a little bit of a rock and a hard place. What the EU27 are asking for, um, be it a border quote unquote up the middle of the Irish Sea, you know, different standards between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, is an absolutely impossible art for the Conservative and Unionist Party. So continues to be a, a big issue, though I can see a little bit of wriggle rule coming from the Irish position, but probably less from the European Union position. Um, so just to remind ourselves of the, the current deadlines and, and timescales, um, We'll, we'll come on to next um, Britain's Brexit white paper, the, the Chequers Agreement. Um, one of the trending Twitter storms at the moment is under the hashtag, hashtag of Chuck Chequers, which I think has um, Boris Johnson um, be, behind it. But what we're now looking at here is the, um, the time scale going forward. At, um, at this point, there is, I think, some doubt I'll go further and I think it is impossible that there will be the necessary political agreement at the October meeting of the European Council. And it is notable that people are now talking about uh, agreement in November and just occasionally um, December. I mean, it, it does slightly remind me of um, being in a negotiation once in, uh, in Nigeria. And the treaty we were renegotiating ran out at midnight. At 10 to midnight, we literally taped a brown paper bag over the clock in the room and uh, set the time at 10 to midnight and carried on till we reached agreement at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's feeling a little bit like that, but um, you know, a, a way will be, find to, will be found to, to eke out a little bit more time. Where that is really, really difficult is the... Um, 2300 hours GMT on the 29th of March 2019, which is when the Article 50 notification takes effect and the UK will leave the European Union. However, um, it is possible that that period can be extended. It can be extended by unanimous agreements of the EU member states and the UK. Um, interestingly, the treaty is silent on which side can ask for it. So either side can ask for it. Others could suggest it. So that, that is not impossible. Um, and I did for the first time a few weeks ago see in a European Commission email, actually using nothing more formal than an email, to a member state, say, unless the Article 50 negotiating period is extended by unanimous consent. So I think um, quite interesting. What makes that really difficult, of course, is that let's say you push that back another year. It would be very, very strange for the UK to be sending MEPs to the European Parliament for a year. So again, politically, not not easy. Um, and we then have, you know, if we do leave on the 29th of March 2019, we then have um, until the end of December 2020, um, always the time the transition period or implementation period, depending on which side the channel you work on, was going to run to because that's the end of the current 
budget cycle. But that's the sort of time scale we're working to. Of course, checkers and the white paper did change things. Um, you could argue, and I, I think probably with some sense, that the Prime Minister in the UK had held her cabinet together by not forcing agreement on exactly what they wanted because clearly there was not going to be agreement. But obviously we got to the point where she and others recognised it was absolutely untenable to go ahead without putting something firm on the table for the EU27 to respond to, which led to Chequers, the now famous Chequers Agreement, though the word agreement is being obeyed a bit. Um, the resignation of David Davis, um, Boris Johnson, and uh, a few others. Um, and Dominic Raab becoming Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. It didn't take me too long to find the two contrasting photographs from discussions between the two Secretaries of State and Michel Barnier. Um, each of these Secretaries of State, David Davis and Dominic Raab, um, are ardent supporters of leaving the European Union. If anything, I would say Dominic Raab had it more viscerally than David Davis. David's um, position on, on Europe is, is based on um, an intellectual analysis of where the world economy is going. I think Dominic Raab just feels more strongly about it. But as I, I didn't have to look very hard to find differences in body language at press conferences after discussions. Um, Michel Barnier rarely smiles or laughs. And the fact that you know, he and Dominic Raab are clearly having a dialogue, albeit at their first meeting, and with David Davis that had gone away, I think speaks to two or three things. I think it speaks to the personalities. Um, I think Dominic Raab is more resilient when he's pushed hard. I think David Davis, um, because he feels strongly, he has the intellectual right on his side, is less good at soaking up the violence, if you like, that comes across the negotiating table and always does in, in these things. I think as well, Dominic Raab has very clearly made the point that he is going to spend more time in Brussels and more time with the EU's lead negotiator to try and get this over the line and uh, was an unkind um, Labour Party, opposition party comment in the House of Commons the other day trying to suggest that Dominic Raab had spent more time with Michel Barnier since he'd taken over than David Davis did in his entire time. Put that to one side, it's a nice cheap shot. I think we have seen a change of pace, we've seen a change of personality, we've seen a change of tone. But the process and the schedule continues forward. We have to solve the technical issues, which are huge. Um, you may have seen press reports uh, around stockpiling of medicines, a piece of work I, I've been quite heavily involved in, um, and you know, comments from a former governor of the Bank of England yesterday that what does it come to when a member of the G7 is having to um, store food and medicines because we've got to this ridiculous stage. I am bound to say there have been some mixed messages from the E27. Um, we have had uh, Michel Barnier himself saying it is helpful to have the Chequers plan. We've had Michel Barnier saying the Chequers plan is untenable and would need significant change. Um, we have had Emmanuel Macron saying this is totally unacceptable and saying that we need a new arrangement with concentric circles and the closer you are, the more you get, the further away, the less you get. So I, I, think, um, I think the Chequers plan, I think the white paper has produced a change of tone. I think it has produced agreement on each side, the need to increase the pace of work and to increase the degree of pragmatism. I would say one point on pragmatism. Um, this was made to me by a, a colleague in Brussels. 
when I said, well, you know, we've made this move, why can't the Commission just respond? And he pointed out that the Commission of the European Union is not a government. The UK is government. It can take decisions. It can take decisions very quickly around the cabinet table or on a conference call. But the European Union, it has a number of institutions which give the negotiator, Michel Barnier, his instructions. They cannot be changed quickly. So there is a real risk here that actually things could go well, but the sheer bureaucracy of an organization which is not a sovereign government but has to defer to 27 others gets in the way of taking forward progress. And so there is always a risk that we snatch defeat from the very jaws of success if we do not understand the procedures that each side has to go through. So looking at the, the short term coming up, which I think is, is probably interesting, we obviously have the Conservative Party conference um, coming up in a couple of weeks. Delighted to say I shall be a fly on the wall. Um, be fascinating to see what happens. We understand that Boris Johnson has already organised a 1,000 1, person rally under that hashtag of Chuck Checkers. Um, however, um, I find it difficult to think that, well, I, I've actually got a, a bottle of champagne uh, bet with a client that on the 1st of April 2019, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom will be Theresa May. I find it very difficult to see the circumstances under which she does not carry on. Um, and again, ha happy to go into that, but Boris Johnson is not popular within the Parliamentary, uh, Parliamentary Conservative Party. Um, and they need to put forward uh, candidates. But there aren't the votes to win a vote of no confidence in the Prime Minister at the moment. So I think you can see her going on. What I think has really changed in the two or three weeks since this slide was constructed is to say, I think we're now clear that the deadline for this is not October and that we will we will go on for a little time after that. Worthwhile, I think, just reflecting what is in the white paper, um, where I think the headline was that it separated out goods and services. Um, and the free trade area for goods now, remembering that services is what 80 85 percent of the UK economy, that the free trade area for goods really important because of Northern Ireland, that, that's a way forward to meet the Northern Ireland commitment and resolve that conundrum. There is fear, and I think that the, the government here came to this late. Actually, tariffs is a bit of a pain, but it's not a massive problem. Massive problem is getting stuff over the border. Um, you know, if you look at the stockpiling proposal on medicines, you could infer that there was a government assumption of up to six weeks of delays getting hard goods across the channel, and of course on standards. So in many ways, tariffs is less of an issue. You know, you've got to pay 8% more for your BMW or your Jaguar, it's probably not a big deal. You have your food and your medicines sitting in a truck in Calais, where there is very, very little refrigerated warehousing space for a month. That's a problem. Hence the focus on goods alongside Northern Ireland. Big acknowledgement, big surprise, big upset for the City of London that um, the Chequers plan acknowledged there'll be more barriers to services than now, given the position of financial services in the um, in our trade with the, the, the EU. And of course, there's this commitment that we don't, I think Alex was at a meeting when I described one of the alternatives as being the UK becoming um, Singapore with more letter, litter and less humidity. Um, I think the government has gone out of its way to say that it will not become uh, an, an offshore 
harbour for goods and services with lesser standards. Um, I won't go through this in detail, you've probably all seen it, but you know, trying to set out the, the, the goods, we have this um, clever way of um, charging customs for the EU, so we become the EU's revenue collector. Um, you know, it's our idea that we would participate in agencies that look after highly regulated sectors. I'm afraid some of this comes back to my colleague's point that the EU is not a government. There is no provision for these sort of arrangements in the treaties. So the EU would have to amend its treaties to allow this to happen. I should mention that for many member states, if the treaties are amended, they have to have a referendum and look how well that went. So this is really difficult stuff for the European Union. Um, you'll notice that the commitment to cooperation on energy and transport, again, sits with the Northern Ireland issue um, and the interconnector over the border there. You have to have a single energy market if you are to meet the government's commitments on Northern Ireland. An attempt here too to find a new way of um, what would the EU will want to call free movement and what we want to call controlled movement um, of our citizens. There's probably a deal there around you know, free movement of citizens in employment or who can um, economically support themselves just as the EU has with, with Switzerland. And again, we're back to, we're not going to go to the bottom of the harbour, we're going to have the same sort of rules on state aid, competition, environment and employment. And quite a significant pitch on security partnership, which has been picked up by some of the member states, and I think is probably going to end up being a done deal. However, for the, for the EU, they have to try and set that against their four pillars of free movement of capital, services, goods, and people. And I think it is very clear that they will stick to the position that they took at the start, is that every bit of free movement you take away in one area, we have to take away in, in another. So in a, a positive moment, I think there is an arm wrestle between these. But again, the EU has been quite strong saying it's the four pillars or no pillars. My personal view, there will be a little movement in that area because it's quite difficult to see how we get forward without that. And I am absolutely convinced that each side wants a deal. Um, there are things that the EU can't give the UK um, because that would just encourage others to try and get good deals without signing up to the rules. But I do think each side wants a deal. So I guess the final question is, how do we get there? Um, you know, if you look at the position in the UK, where you've got different heavyweight political actors jockeying for position, Theresa May trying to hold the, the middle ground. Um, pressure is rising here for a people's vote. It must not be called a second referendum. It's a people's vote on the substance of the deal once it is agreed. Um, if you believe the opinion polls, I leave you to decide whether you believe the opinion polls, then there is a majority, I think in the 50%, so I don't think we yet broken 60, might have got there, uh, in favour of a people's vote which is usually described as a vote to take the deal that has been negotiated or to remain in the European Union. So that is possible. We have people on both sides, even people now who have been quite strong Remainers, arguing that this negotiating process is so difficult, we should apply for a short or medium term membership of the EEA. Um, 
you have got others saying we should extend the Article 50 notice period. My personal view is if all these people who are trying to do something came together behind one alternative solution, it may gather ground. At the moment, we have got the Prime Minister, and I, and I think it was Nick Clegg who said that he felt the sadness of Theresa May was that she really did feel that delivering Brexit was her destiny. And she's sticking very, very strongly to this. You know, we now have the last opinion poll on the Remain, I think, showed 59% of Brits now preferring to remain. And the Prime Minister has said that it would be an abrogation of democracy to have another vote. So I can only assume we will have another, and never have another general election if you take that logic to its end result. In the UK, this issue is every bit as difficult, if not more difficult, for the Labour Party as it is for the Conservative Party. The majority of Labour voters voted to leave the European Union. The majority of Labour members voted to remain in the European Union. Its trade union support is largely in favour of remaining in the European Union. The test that it has given for the success of the negotiations can only be met by remaining in the European Union. And Keir Starmer there on, on the bottom left has been doing a brilliant job in gradually nudging the party towards some of these alternatives when his leader, Jeremy Corbyn, would clearly prefer to leave the European Union. So this is not just a problem for government. It's a bigger problem for government because they are the government. But at a party level, this is just as big a problem for the Labour Party. And we are, of course, getting to the point where for the European Union, there are now going to be some hard decisions to be taken. Now, as I said earlier, it is important for many of the member states that the principles of the project are stuck to. The European Commission in particular also has a strong track record of waiting until the last minute and seeing the drop and blinking. Um, deals are always done at a minute to midnight. So if we get to a minute to midnight and a rather more youthful looking Jean-Claude Juncker is looking over the precipice, what could come out of all of this? So I think the house view here at Instinctive Partners is the negotiators will find a way to go forward. It could be a fudge deal. It could be a withdrawal agreement that doesn't quite tie down that last 10%. And it's agreed that that will be done within, let's say, the first nine months of the 20 month transition period. It is possible that the Article 50 process could be extended. Um, I think that's more politically difficult than the first um, on, on both sides, but particularly for the UK government. Temporary EEA membership, I don't see flying, but it is it is proposed. And I think the idea is we would become Norway forever. I think the people's vote is beginning to gain ground. I, I said to someone over lunch today when they said, do you think the chances have, been, have increased? I said, yes, they've doubled from 4% to 8%, but it's growing. We should not ignore the facts that in all of this, the British Parliament has begun to find its feet. It is beginning to challenge the government. It has so far pulled back at the brink itself from total confrontation with the executive. But once you feed the dog red meat, the dog gets to like red meat. And I think it is entirely possible that the UK Parliament will flex its muscles closer to the time and assert its sovereignty. The European Parliament may wish to do the same. Equally, it has a track record of pulling back. 
And then, of course, there's the member states. So the UK government's um, strategy of trying to do deal with the member states behind Michel Barnier's back has been the failure it was always going to be. Um, I was at a reception in Brussels on Tuesday evening and somebody, um, a Belgian, said to me, congratulations, for the first time you have created unanimity within the European Union. Um, and I think that, that was always going to be the outcome, maybe until we're standing on the edge of the precipice and, and things move. But uh, by then, of course, from an, ec an economic point of view, many financial services operations, not companies, but operations will have left the UK and gone to Amsterdam or Paris, a few to Frankfurt where their staff had never been there before. Um, you will have seen the European Medicines Agency leave London and go to Amsterdam. So even if there is a people's vote, the British Parliament flexes its muscles and the decision is that the UK withdraws the Article 50 nomination, which it clearly can, the UK will still be severely wounded by this process, in my personal opinion. So what does that mean for those of us trying to make sense of this, trying to work with our companies throughout the process? And I, I was trying to find some glib phrases, and I thought Roosevelt speaks softly and carry a big stick and you'll go far, was very appropriate here. I mean, the view that we are taking in how you deal with Brexit is also very much hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, we, we've done a survey of our clients, and it is interesting that two months ago, fewer said that they were ready for Brexit than did eight months ago. So I think people relaxed a little bit. Um, I guess the other thing that is apparent is it will keep changing. Um, whatever you think you can plan for will not happen. The twists and turns, I'm afraid, will continue. And I've been saying for 18 months, anybody who tells you they know how this ends up is a charlatan. I think you can see some trends, you can see some possibilities, but anything, I'm afraid, is still on the table. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Warwick. Um, before we jump into it, we've got 10 minutes for questions. You can ask Warwick a question via the question box. Just please do put your question in and I will throw it out to him. Um, I'm going to kick this off, Warwick. My question is, um, how is the government or how are MPs listening to, to business? Um, actually, gonna, I'm going to throw out a second question. And with that, do they really understand how businesses operate and essentially the need for us to, to understand what is coming uh, and plan for, for okay, known uncertainty? But with, with Brexit, we have so many things which are unknown. Do they, do they understand any of this which, uh, which we're going through as businesses, as organisations? Um, thanks, Alex. I, I think I'll take the first one first. Government has engaged with those sectors which really put the effort in. So I would say that the pharmaceutical sector and financial services sector have done most work, bluntly have spent most money on putting the case together and making the management consultancies and law firms happy. And they have had a good hearing. I think this is one of those areas, however, where the emotion of politics and the emotion of the issue trumps the practicalities of business. Um, I have been in meetings with senior officials and with ministers when they have clearly understood that it is now too late to give the sort of clarity you're talking about and for industry to cope with the forthcoming change because there will be change. 
and they know that and they can do nothing about it. Um, and so you know, if, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry, which is one I'm, I'm close to, so the government does understand what's going on. It has been asking for this associate membership of the European Medicines Agency. Um, it has promised in the, the No Deal Brexit papers released a couple of weeks ago that it won't require medicines approved in the EU to be reapproved in the UK. They will be grandfathered over. Um, and some of the more granular procedures before a, a medicine can, can be sold, they won't require the industry to go through in the UK if it's gone through the EU. So I think at that level, Alex, they, they have listened. Um, but I think only to a very small number of sectors. And, and to be blunt, you know, if, if an, an industry that saves lives couldn't get its case across, who could? Uh, we have two great questions from Kat Summer. Um, so she essentially asked something similar. Um, you know, a business is best advised to channel their concerns and lobbying through trade associations. Uh, so that's the first question. The second question is, looking beyond Brexit and looking to new international trade agreements, um, are you seeing companies starting to, to look towards the possibility of these trade agreements and working out what they would want from any respective new trade agreement which the UK may begin to negotiate? Um, hi, Kat. Um, so I think the larger trade associations have gained more traction than the companies. Um, I mean, my, my, my normal view on these things is the government also needs to see the whites of the eyes of the companies um, you know, to make it real. Um, and I still think that is the case. But I think that there is an issue with bandwidth here, that there just isn't enough time in government to meet as many people as they would want to. So it's, it's clear that the, 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 the trade associations um, that have got their act together have led the way. Um, some of their larger members have also done good work, but it's been usually in cooperation with, with their, their trade associations. I think companies that have tried to strike out on their own have found it pretty tough. Um, looking forward to new trade agreements, then I am just beginning to see that happening. So if I talk pharmaceuticals again, um, I know that uh, initial discussions have taken place between the UK and the US. I know that the trade associations for that sector are engaged with USTR. Um, and I know the trade associations here are, are engaged with the Department for International Trade. So yes, that, that is beginning to happen. Um, I, th I think it does raise all sorts of challenges for business in the same way as it does for government in terms of bandwidth. Um, I can't remember the number, but uh, tens of trade agreements that the UK is part of because of its membership of the European Union sort of have to be grandfathered over, which sort of makes you think that actually that's easy. It's, it's not easy. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff published uh, a couple of months ago on tariffs and quotas for the World Trade Organization when the UK becomes a full member in its own right. The amount of work to go through is, is absolutely huge. Um, so I can say from the UK point of view, the Department of International Trade is very keen to hear from companies and sectors. Um, they are very open to discussions. Um, my experience, you'll be unsurprised if the people there are very bright and very young and quite inexperienced and are, are desperate to learn about the, the sectors that they are having to represent. So I, I think we are probably just beyond that tipping point where it is now sensible for business to start looking at those new trade agreements. Perhaps not because there are massive opportunities there, but because there are huge threats there. Good, and I've, I've had one more question coming in, looking at the impact of Brexit and all this confusion in terms of 
um, employees. Um, what are you seeing in, internally with, with companies? How are they engaging employees, especially employees who are UK nationals, European nationals? Um, how are they dealing with this confusion? So I, I think the, the better employers have tried to give comfort and assurance to particularly um, EU nationals, non-Brits working in the UK. Um, I think the, um, the position the government has taken has gradually got clearer, though no less bureaucratic. Um, but you know, I, I, I think, again, if it's a point I really didn't touch on earlier when I was saying, you know, tariffs is one thing, but manageable delays of border is a problem. You know, getting staff is a real problem. Um, and, and I know, I, I, I think there's, there's some confusion here. You know, people talk about unskilled fruit pickers in a sort of derogatory way. You know, we don't have any fruit pickers. You know, we need fruit pickers. But we also need nurses. You know, we have seen an increase in the number of non-EU nurses coming into the UK and we still have a shortage of nurses. The government has opened up the, um, the quotas for nurses coming into the UK, but we are still seeing a net exodus of European Union nurses. And I think uh, that's what happens if those people do not feel comforted and do not get the reassurance that they need to the fullest extent it can be given by their employer. Wonderful. Um, I think we are at an end. Um, I want to, to thank you once again, Warwick. It's been a great webinar focusing on a, on a big issue for all of us. Uh, so thank you for your time. It's a real pleasure to talk to everyone. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we will catch up with you soon. Take care. Bye, everyone.